capability and its very deep flaws. People are finding ways to use it, in it for great productivity gains or other gains and understand the limitations. So a system that is sometimes right, sometimes creative, often totally wrong, you actually don't want that to drive your car, um, but you're, you're happy for it to uh, you know, like help, help you brainstorm what to write about or help you with code that you get to check. And so we have help, been... Help us understand why can't it drive my car? Well, there are, I mean, there are great self-driving car systems, but uh, like at this point, you know, Waymo's around San Francisco are, uh, there are a lot of them and people love them. Um, what I meant is like the sort of open AI style of model right. is good at some things, but not good at sort of like a life and death situation. Um, but people under, I think people understand tools and tool limitations of tools more than we often give them credit for. And people have found ways to make ChatGPT super useful to them and understand like what not to use it for, for the most part. So I think it's a very good sign that even at these systems, current extremely limited capability levels, you know, much worse than what we'll have this year to say nothing of what we'll have next year. Uh, people, lots of people have found ways to get value out of them and also to understand their limitations. So, you know, I think it's AI has been somewhat demystified uh, because people really use it now. And uh, that's, I think, always the best way to pull the world forward with a new technology. The, the thing that I think people worry about is the ability to trust AI. You know, at what, at what, at what level can you say, I'm really okay with the AI doing it, you know, whether it's driving the car, writing the paper, filling out the medical form. And part of that trust, I think, always comes when you understand wh how yeah. it works. And one of the problems uh, AI researchers have, AI engineers have, is figuring out why it does what it does. Um, you know, how the neural network operates, yeah. what weights it assigns to various things. Um, do you think that we will get there, or is it getting so inherently complicated that we are at some level just going to have to trust the black box? So on, on the first part of your question, um, I think humans are f f pretty forgiving of other humans making mistakes, but not really at all forgiving of computers making mistakes. And so people who say things like, well, you know, self-driving cars are already safer than human-driven cars, it probably has to be safer by a factor of, I, I would guess, like between 10 and 100 before people will accept it, maybe even more. And I think the same thing is going to happen for other AI systems, caveated by the fact that if people know, if people are accustomed to using a tool and know it may be totally wrong, um, that's kind of okay. I think, you know, in some sense, the hardest part is when it's right 99.999% of the time and you let your guard down. Um, I also think that what it means to verify or understand what's going on is going to be a little bit different than people think right now. I actually can't look in your brain and look at the 100 trillion synapses uh, and try to understand what's happening in each one and say, okay, I really understand why he's thinking what he's thinking. You're not a black box to me. Um, but what I can ask you to do is explain to me your reasoning. I can say, you know, you think this thing, why? And you can explain first this, then this, then there's this conclusion, then that one, and then there's this. And I can decide if that sounds reasonable to me or not. And I think our AI systems will also be able to do the same thing. They'll be able to explain to us in natural language the steps from, from A to B, and we can decide whether we think those are good steps, even if we're not looking into it and saying, okay, I see each connection here, and you know, I don't get to like, I think we'll be able to do more to x-ray the brain of an AI than x-ray the brain of you and understand what those connections are. But at the level that you or I will have to sort of decide, do we agree with this conclusion? We'll make that determination the same way we'd ask each other, explain to me your reasoning. Um, one of the things you and I have talked earlier, and one of the things you've always um, emphasized was that you thought AI can be very friendly, very benign, very empathetic. And I want to hear from you what you think, um, what do you think is left for a human being to do if the AI can out-analyze a human being can out-calculate a human being. A lot of people then say, well, that, will th you know, that means what we will be left with, our core innate humanness will be our emotional intelligence, our empathy, our ability to care for others. But do you think AI could do that better than us as well? 
And if so, what, what's the core competence of human beings? I think there will be a lot of things. Humans really care about what other humans think. That seems very deeply uh, wired into us. So chess uh, was one of the first like victims of AI, right? Deep Blue could be Kasparov, whenever that was a long time ago. And all of the commentators said, um, this is the end of chess. Now that a computer can beat the human, you know, no one's gonna, no one's gonna bother to watch chess again ever. It's over, or play chess again. Chess has, I think, never been more popular than it is right now. Um, and if you like cheat with AI, that's a big deal. And no one, or almost no one, watches two AIs play each other. Um, we're like very interested in what humans do. When I read a book that I love, the first thing I do when I finish is like I want to know everything about the author's life, and I want to like feel some connection to that person that made this thing that resonated with me. And, uh, you know, like, what, same thing for like many other products, that, that humans know what other humans want very well. Humans are also very interested in other people. I think humans are gonna, we're gonna have better tools. We've had better tools before, but we're still like very focused on each other. And I think we will do things with better tools. And I admit, it does feel different this time. General purpose cognition feels so close to what we all treasure about humanity that it does feel different. So of course, you know, there will be kind of the human roles where you want another human, but even without that, I think, like when I think about my job, I'm certainly not a great AI researcher. Um, my, my, my role is to like, you know, figure out what we're gonna do, think about that, and then like work with other people to coordinate and make it happen. And I think everyone's job will look a little bit more like that. We will all operate at a little bit higher of a level of abstraction. We will all have access to a lot more capability. Um, and we'll still like make decisions. They may trend more towards curation over time, but we'll make decisions about what should happen. Well, Sam Altman sees A's limited capabilities, but notes its productivity gains. Users, aware of its flaws, can leverage AI effectively. This reflects a pragmatic approach, acknowledging both potential and challenges. Altman also underscores the importance of trust in AI, advocating for transparency. He envisions AI systems explaining their decisions in natural language, enhancing user understanding and confidence. Moving forward, some influential figures like Elon Musk and Bill Gates express concerns about AI's potential risks. However, Sam Altman holds a relatively benign view. What could be the factor shaping his viewpoint? Let's hear his response. Sam, when I look at technology, my fear is often, um, what would bad people do with this technology? But there are pe many people who fear this much larger issue of the technology ruling over us, right? Uh, you've always taken a benign view of, of AI, or relatively benign view. But people like Elon Musk and sometimes Bill Gates and uh, other very, people, uh, very smart people who know a lot about the field are very, very worried. What, what is it, what do you, why is it that you think they're wrong? What is it that they're not understanding about AI? Well, I don't think they're guaranteed to be wrong. I, I mean, I think there's a spirit, there, there's a part of it that's right, which is this is, this is a technology that's clearly very powerful and that we, we don't know, we cannot say with certainty exactly what's going to happen. And that's the case with you know, all, all new major technological revolutions. But it's easy to imagine with this one, um, that it's going to have like massive effects on the world and that it could go very wrong. Um, the, the technological direction that we've been trying to push it in is one that we think we can make safe. And that includes a lot of things. It's, um, we believe in iterative deployment. So we put this technology out into the world uh, along the way. So people get used to it. So we have time as a society, our institutions have time to have these discussions, figure out how to regulate this, how to put some guardrails in place. Um, can you technically kind of put guardrails in, write a kind of constitution for an AI system? Would that work? If you look at the progress from GPT-3 to GPT-4 about how well it can align itself to a set of values, um, we've made massive progress there. Now, there's a harder question than the technical one, which is who gets to decide what those values are and what the defaults are, what the bounds are, how does it work in this country versus that country, what am I allowed to do with it versus not. Um, so that's a big societal question, uh, you know, one of the biggest. But the, from, the, from the technological approach, I think there's, um, there's room for optimism, although 
the alignment techni techniques we have now, I don't think will scale all the way to much more powerful systems. We're gonna need to invent new things. So I think it's good that people are afraid of the downsides of this technology. Uh, I think it's good that we're talking about it. I think it's good that we and others are being held to a high standard. And you know, we can, we can draw on a lot of lessons from the past about how technology has been made to be safe and also how the different stakeholders in society have handled their negotiations about what safe means and what safe enough is. Um, but I, I have a lot of empathy for the, the general nervousness and discomfort of the world towards companies like us and you know our, our, the other people doing similar things, which is like, what, why is our future in their hands? Um, and what, why, are, why, do they, why are they doing this? Why do they get to do this? And I think it is on us, I, I mean, I believe, and I think the world now believes that the, the benefit here is so tremendous that we should go do this. But I think it is on us to figure out a way to get the input from society about how we're gonna make these decisions, not only about you know, what, what the values of the system are, but what the safety thresholds are and what kind of global coordination we need to ensure that stuff that happens in one country does not super negatively impact another um, to, to show that picture. So I think not having caution, um, not feeling the gravity of what the potential stakes are would be very bad. So I, I like that people are nervous about it. We have our own nervousness, but we believe that we can manage through it. And the only way to do that is to put the technology in the hands of people, let society and the technology co-evolve, and sort of step by step, with a very tight feedback loop and course correction, build these systems that deliver tremendous value while meeting the sort of safety requirements. While Musk and Gates express concerns about AI, Altman takes a more optimistic stance. He sees AI as a friendly tool, leaving space for human emotions. This optimism shines through, showcasing diverse viewpoints. He was asked about when the New York Times sued OpenAI, claiming improper use of their content. How did he address this issue? Let's delve into his response. Sam, I have to ask you, the New York Times uh, is suing you um, and claims that uh, the, the gist of what the Times is saying is that OpenAI, other AI companies as well, uses New York Times articles as an input that allows it to make the language predictions that it makes. Uh, and it does so excessively and, and properly and without compensating the New York Times. Uh, isn't it true that at the, at the end of the day, uh, uh, every AI model is using all this data that is in the public domain, and shouldn't the people who wrote that data, whether it's uh, newspapers or comedians who've, who've yeah. written jokes, shouldn't they all get compensated? Many, many thoughts about that. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the difference between training and what we display when a user sends a query. Um, by the way, with the New York Times, as I had understood it, we were in productive negotiations with them. We wanted to pay the New York Times a lot of money to display their content. We were as surprised as anybody else to read that they were suing us in the New York Times. Um, that was sort of a strange thing. But we, we, would, we, we, we are open to training on the New York Times, but it's not our priority. We actually don't need to train on their data. I think this is something that people don't understand, is any one particular training source that doesn't move the needle for us that much. Um, what we want to do with the content owners, like the New York Times, and like deals that we have done with many other publishers, and we'll do more over time, is when a user says, hey, ChatGPT, what happened to Davos today? We would like to display content, uh, link out, uh, show brands of places like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or any other great publication and say, here's what happened um, today. Here's this real-time information um, that you're, and then we'd like to pay for that. We'd like to drive traffic for that. Um, but it's displaying that information when the user queries, not using it to train the model. Um, now, on, we could also train the model on it, but it's not our priority. We're happy not to, and, and that, I, I think everyone- well, you're happy not to with any specific one, but if you don't train on any data, you don't have any facts to train the I data. I was gonna get there on, to the next point. Um, one thing that I expect to start changing is these models will be able to take smaller amounts of higher quality data during their training process and think harder about it and learn more. You don't need to read 2,000 biology textbooks to understand you know, high school level biology. Maybe you need to read one, maybe three. 
but that 2,000th and first is certainly not gonna help you much. And as, we, as our models begin to work more that way, we won't need the same massive amounts of training data. But what we want in any case is to find new economic models that work for the whole world, including content owners. And although I think it's clear that if you read a textbook about physics, you get to go do physics later with what you learned, and that's kind of considered okay. Um, if we're gonna teach someone else physics using your textbook and, and, and using your lesson plans, we'd like to find a way to, for you to get paid for that. If you teach our models, if you help pr provide the human feedback, um, I'd love to find new models for you to get paid based off the success of that. So I, I think there's a great need for new economic models. I think the current conversation is focused a little bit at the wrong level. And I think what it means to train these models is, in, is gonna change a lot in the, in the next few years. So Altman tackles the legal matter by emphasizing OpenAI's commitment to compensating content owners for displaying their content. Training on specific data isn't the primary focus, highlighting a collaborative and payment-oriented approach. Lastly, a personal perspective. Sam Altman was involved in a widely publicized boardroom scandal. What lessons did he draw from that experience, especially in the context of leadership amid the looming era of artificial general intelligence? Let's hear his reflections. Sam, you were involved in what is perhaps the most uh, widely publicized boardroom scandal in, uh, in recent decades. Uh, what lesson did you learn from that, other than, other than trust Satya Nadella? Sam, at least he's asking you when you only have 42 seconds left, so, you know. No, you can take more. I think people will wait to hear this answer. Um, I mean, a, a lot of things. Uh, I'm trying to think what I can say. <laughs> Be honest, at, some point you, at some point, you just have to laugh. <laughs> like at some point, it just gets, uh, it's so ridiculous. But I think, I mean, I could point to all the obvious lessons that you don't want to leave important, you don't want important but not urgent problems out there hanging. And you know, we had known that our board had gotten too small and we knew that we didn't have the level of experience we needed. But last year was such a wild year for us in so many ways that we sort of just neglected it. I think one more important thing, though, um, is as the world gets closer to AGI, um, the stakes, the stress, the level of tension, um, that's all going to go up. And for us, this was a microcosm of it, but probably not the most stressful experience we ever face. Um, and one thing that I've sort of observed for a while is every one step we take closer to very powerful AI, um, everybody's, everybody's character gets like plus 10 crazy points. It's a very stressful thing, and it should be, because we're trying to be responsible about very high stakes. And so I think that as, I think one lesson um, is as we get, we the whole world, uh, get closer to very powerful AI, I expect more strange things. And having a higher level of preparation, more resilience, um, more time spent thinking about all of the strange ways things can go wrong, um, that's really important. The, the, the best thing I learned uh, throughout this, by far, was about the strength of our team. Um, when the board first asked me, like the day after firing me, uh, if I want to talk about coming back, my immediate response was no, because I was just very pissed by about a lot of the things about it. And then, you know, I quickly kind of like got to my senses and I realized I didn't want to see all the value get destroyed and all these wonderful people who had put their lives into this and all of our customers. But, but I did also know, uh, and I had seen it from watching the executive team and really the whole company do, do stuff in that period of time, like the, the company would be fine without me. The team, you know, either the people that I hired uh, or how I mentored them or whatever you want to call it, like they were ready to do it. And that was such a satisfying thing, both personally about, you know, whatever I had done, but like knowing that we had built, we all of us, the whole team, had built this like unbelievably high functioning and tight organization. Um, that was my best learning of the whole thing. Thank you all. Thank you. As we conclude this insightful journey into Sam Altman's perspectives on technology, leadership, and AI, we invite you to share your thoughts in the comments below. What resonated with you the most? Don't forget to subscribe for more thought-provoking discussions. Thank you.